Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We'll be exploring hypnosis today, and with me is Professor Stanley Krippner, the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University, an individual who has received lifetime achievement awards from several societies, the Parapsychological Association and the International Association for the Study of Dreams, and I'll bet probably several others because he is a past president of two divisions of the American Psychological Association. and other associations, oh, like the Association for Humanistic Psychology. Welcome again, Stan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I know you've worked extensively in hypnosis, and you and I share something in common, which yes. is that uh, we both grew up in Wisconsin, and we both learned hypnosis while we were still high school students in Wisconsin. So your history of working with hypnosis goes back many, many decades. Yes, it does. I found that uh, hypnosis was very useful to me in high school as a way to prepare for, for example, the SAT test. Well, my interest in hypnosis actually goes back to my grade school years because one of my favorite comic books was Mandrake the Magician. Oh, yes. And Mandrake the Magician would create his magical effects by gesturing hypnotically, and somebody would see things that weren't there or hear things that weren't there, and that is how he fought crime and um, helped people in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Well, and surely seeing and hearing things that weren't there has been part of your research in parapsychology also. Yes, that's right. So Mandrake was also, shall we say, focal and interesting me in parapsychology. Yeah. And then when I was in high school, I had learned a parlor trick from a friend of mine in another school, and I put it to use in our high school parties and that was to ask if anybody wanted to be hypnotized. And in advance, I had prepared a simple plate from the kitchen, holding it over the candle so it was black soot on the bottom. And then I had people look at a candle flame, and I would simply tell them that they were going deeper and deeper into hypnosis. And then I would give them the plate to hold in one hand, and I would say, now we're going to see how well you follow directions. Rub your finger in a circular manner around the bottom of the plate. Now, it took you a few seconds to figure out what was circular. That indicates you're going deeply into hypnosis. Now take your hand and put it on your right cheek. And again, probably took you a little while to separate right from left. That means you're going to hypnosis. And now bring it down toward your chin. And of course, as they brought it down toward their chin, the black soot was on their face. Mm -hmm. And then I had them do the same thing, rubbing counterclockwise on the bottom, and this time doing it on the left cheek. And so, after all was said and done, I said, now we're going to take you uh, to a mirror and look in the mirror, and you won't even recognize yourself <laughs> you're so deeply hypnotized. So we showed the mirror, turned on the lights, and of course everybody laughed. Well, you're a trickster. Yes, at that <laughs> point I was, yes. And, and it's very intriguing because you've written extensively about shamans who work with hypnosis or hypnotic modalities and who are also tricksters. Oh, yes, tricksters are a very essential uh, role that uh, shamans play. As Rolling Thunder, the shaman I knew for 20 years, once told me, sometimes you have to trick people into doing well mm -hmm. and to feeling better. Mm -hmm. And, well, people say the same about hypnosis. It's just trickery. And I always say, actually, in hypnosis, you try to get the person to hypnotize themselves because hypnos hypnosis is what we might call 
inducing believed in imaginings. Mm -hmm. The person is asked to imagine something, something for their benefit, of course, whether it be to feel better, to take exams uh, more, uh, more accurately, or to uh, remember something that's important. Mm -hmm. And once the imagination comes into the picture, you know that this is coming from the hypnotized person, him or herself. It's not something that you are imposing upon the person. Mm -hmm. Well, there are all sorts of negative stories about hypnosis, the Manchurian candidate uh, types of, of uh, scenarios. I, I would imagine to the extent that it is a powerful psychological tool and the research is quite extraordinary. It's one of, I think, the most powerful tools we have. It probably does have negative applications. Well, anything positive can have a negative application. Uh, the example I often use is psychedelics. Psychedelics are useful for many things and helpful for many, many people. They also have a negative side. For some people, they can throw them into psychosis or they can cause extreme psychological damage. No. In hypnosis, in the hands of a qualified practitioner, I make the point that hypnosis is perfectly safe. With an unqualified practitioner or with a malevolent practitioner, yes, hypnosis can be used very, very negatively. And again, when I say hypnosis reaches the ability the person has to imagine something, if a hypnotist were to have them, if a hypnotist were having them, imagine, having them imagine something very, very negative or actually mm -hmm. very, very harmful, they might indeed do this. Mm -hmm. By and large, a person will not do something against their ethical code. But let's say a person has a very fragile or even negative ethical code, a malevolent practitioner could very easily cause them to create a crime of some sort, a very serious crime under the influence of hypnosis. Or could create a scenario where they don't realize what they're doing. That's right. They could do something negative like harming a person or even robbing a bank, mm -hmm. thinking that this was part of a movie script or a movie yeah. scenario. Mm -hmm. Of course, this only applies to that very small percentage of people who are highly hypnotizable. Mm -hmm. And as my dear friend Ted Barber once demonstrated, there are three types of highly suggestible people. One is the hallucinatory people who are actually hallucinating under hypnosis mm -hmm. and who are actually, these are the people that see things that are not there or hear things that are not happening. Yeah. The other ones are the high fantasy people who have the ability to emphasize something. Yeah, they know this is a fantasy, but it's something they can allow themselves to believe in temporarily. Mm -hmm. And then the third type is the highly motivated person who wants to hip be hypnotized so badly that they will go along with the hypnotist says and comply as tightly and as closely as they can. Mm -hmm. Those are highly hypnotizable people. Hypnosis virtuosos, as well, we call them. What percentage of the population would you say are hypnosis? Less than 10%. Uh-huh. Yes. Other people can be helped by hypnosis. I, of course, rarely run into a hypnotic virtuoso, and I generally tell the people, after this is over, you will remember everything that happened, and that's essential if you're to carry through on the post-hypnotic suggestions I'm going to give you, mm -hmm. if you're going to put this to practical use, especially the work that I've done with uh, uh, helping people do better in school or take exams better. Mm -hmm. and. So you must know that you were really hypnotized. And so then I give them some very simple tests that convince them that they're hypnotized. Most often I have the arm levitation test mm -hmm. where they hold out their arm and I say, now, I want you to resist that arm going down, but I'm going to use hypnotic instructions to tell you the arm is going down. Now I'm going to tell you that your arm is getting heavier and heavier as you go deeper and deeper into hypnosis. So there is a chance for somebody to challenge the hypnosis. Yes. Almost always that hand and arm go down and then the person is convinced that indeed they are hypnotized. Mm -hmm. Because 
it creates a sense of ambivalence. Part of them really wants to be hypnotized, but another more conscious part of them wants to resist because they've been told to try to resist. In both cases, they're following my instructions. Mm -hmm. I've told them to resist, that's an instruction, and I've told them the arm is going down. So, this is a little bit of a confusion, and the confusion actually accelerates the hypnotic effect. Mm -hmm. Well, when I think of hypnosis, I, I often think of some of the most dramatic things that are reported, such as the raising of warts and blisters and uh, effects on the skin. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even stigmata, I think, are, can be produced under hypnosis. Oh, yes. I think that this is within the realm of possibility. I once hypnotized a friend of my stepson when we were living in New York City, and he wanted to be hypnotized. I think he thought he had a past life as a pirate. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I don't know if you had a past life of a pirate or not, but I'm going to help you imagine what your life was like as a pirate. And he had this wonderful scenario as a pirate, and then he had the uh, feeling that somebody was making an X on his chest with a sword blade mm -hmm. as part of the scenario. Mm -hmm. After the hypnosis is over, he unbuttoned his shirt, there was a red X on his chest. Oh my. So, yes, hypnosis can be used to produce blisters, more important that can be used to take away warts mm -hmm. because if you strangle the blood vessels to the wart and get them to stop sending blood to the wart, the wart will shrivel up and die. I once self-hypnotized myself to get rid of a wart, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. I never had a wart before, I haven't won one since, but I told myself that the blood vessels were going to stop sending blood to the wart and the wart was going to die as a result of the absence of blood to replenish the blood supply. And within a few days, it did. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier you said that when you hypnotize people, you really want them to hypnotize themselves. So it's, uh, you seem to be suggesting that self-hypnosis is the basic model of all hypnosis. That's my feeling, yes. Um, on some occasions, friends of mine or students of mine will ask me to help them stop smoking cigarettes mm -hmm. to, using tobacco. And so as part of that treatment, I teach them how to use self-hypnosis because I want them to practice mm -hmm. what I've taught them and what I have done personally. And as you probably know, tobacco addiction is the hardest addiction to beat, much harder than heroin, much harder than amphetamine addiction. Mm -hmm. And I've had friends who have had all three, and they agree that hip, that uh, that uh, tobacco addiction is the hardest, and so they've come to me to help them get rid of the tobacco addiction. Mm -hmm. Some hypnotists can do it in one session. I cannot. I cannot. I often do it over a weekend. I continue by telephone, mm -hmm. or have them see me from time to time over the a week a long span of time. And I've had 12 successes and one failure. My one failure was with Jerry Garcia. Mm. During the last year of his life, he wanted to stop smoking. The, I knew he really wanted to stop taking heroin, but I didn't make an issue about the it. The Grateful Dead guitarist. Yes, yes, the Grateful Dead guitarist. And he knew that his health was failing. He knew that there was something wrong. And so it came. he came to my office shortly after I'd returned from Spain, where I was hit by a car and almost killed, so I was in a wheelchair. Oh. I was not in the most vital condition to hypnotize anybody, but I couldn't sh turn Jerry down. And so I knew I had just one session with him. I didn't think one session would be enough. So I did my usual routine with him, and then I had a dietitian, Stuart Fisher of New York City, who's the author of the Park Avenue Diet, come up with a menu of good foods that he should take. Mm. And so he promised that he would take the foods, and I hypnotized him and read off the foods. Mm -hmm. That was part of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think the hypnosis did much to help his addictions, 
But I am told that he changed his diet. That might have given him a few extra days of well, life. Who that's knows? That's something. So that was something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, so you would agree then that self hypnosis is is really the 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 fundamental there that uh, people don't need a uh, outside uh, authority to give them suggestions. We can do it for ourselves yeah, just some, as effectively. Yeah, some people don't need it. Other people do need it. It all goes into what in psychology we call the locus control. Mm -hmm. Some people have very good locus of control, and they can read a book of instructions that says, yes, I can give myself those suggestions, mm -hmm. and they can do the self-hypnosis or the self-suggestion and have good results. Mm -hmm. Other people have a very weak locus of control. They want the locus of control to come from the outside. And so the hypnotist becomes the locus of control. But then the skillful local, the, the skillful hypnotist, will bring the locus of control into mm -hmm. the person and strengthen their own resolve, mm -hmm. their own locus of control. People who don't have a strong locus of control typically, as I understand it, are, are people who, who think that uh, they're, they don't control their own life. The, the outside factors are forcing uh, them to do this and that. I'm afraid so, and of course they're very prone to become members of religious cults. They're very prone to be controlled by demagogues, political or religious demagogues, mm -hmm. and so internalizing the locus of control yeah. is extremely important. Mm -hmm. I should mention that this is one of the differences between self-hypnosis and meditation, they're not the same at all. Because meditation, as you well know from your own practice, is not really goal-oriented. You just do the meditation for its own sake. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has useful, bio, useful side effects. It changes the brain for the better. It helps relax people. It helps to uh, uh, give people a more balanced life. But you don't aim for those things. These are byproducts. You're just in the here and the now. Uh, meditation is self-regulated attention. Mm -hmm. So meditation does not damage your own locus of control. It really strengthens it because even though you might feel very formless during meditation, it's you who has initiated the meditation. Mm -hmm. So meditation is nothing like self-hypnosis. Those are Two different, two different approaches to modifying consciousness. And the key to self-hypnosis, then, is that you have an objective. Have an objective, yes. You just don't do it for the fun of it. You have an objective, right? To improve uh, your study habits or to uh, help uh, cure an illness or to uh, get out of uh, a, a, an addictive habit that you might have. Absolutely. When I was at uh, a dormitory counselor in college, and after college, when I was working with learning disability students at mm -hmm. Kent State University and in my graduate work, I would often use hypnosis um, to help people take examinations better, relax before a test, focus their ex attention during examinations, and for the younger clients, most of them were children who had to have parental consent, I emphasized focus and avoiding distractions because a lot of learning disability children mm -hmm. have attention deficit disorder and so their attention is all over the place. You've got to get them to focus the attention and hypnosis can be very helpful there. Mm -hmm. And I've actually published half a dozen articles on this topic many, many years ago and I have to say those articles are still cited. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of my minor contributions to the hypnosis literature. Now, another way of looking at hypnosis is that it's something that often happens to us unwittingly. Uh, for example, uh, the late Charles Musez presented a paper many years ago at the uh, Society for the Anthropological Study of Consciousness in which he suggested that it's through hypnosis that we become acculturated, that we incorporate the values of the society around us, learn language, become a, a you know, a, um, a conforming citizen because of we, we are unwittingly hypnotized by the cultures we're in. 
Yes, I would call this suggestion. Mm -hmm. I only use the word hypnosis for something that is defined as hypnosis by an operator or by the person, him okay. or herself. Unless they have that definition, mm -hmm. that name, I don't call it hypnosis. Mm -hmm. I get very irritated by books say, oh yes, hypnosis, hypnosis was done thousands of years ago in China and in Egypt. No, hypnosis is not done until the name was coined by James Braid, mm -hmm. who picked it up from somebody else as recently as the 18th century. Yeah. And before that, it was, yes, hypnotic-like, it was suggestion, but doesn't get called hypnosis. Okay. Well, when we look at the early days of hypnosis, uh, especially in, in the early 19th century, you, you find very dramatic reports of, of, for example, surgeries being performed before they had uh, modern anesthetics. That's right, yes. Uh, they, they would do major surgeries, amputations, and under hypnosis, those patients were able to, uh, well, uh, some reported they didn't experience any discomfort. Oh, good heavens, James Braid did dozens of such operations in India. Yeah. And he didn't like the term hypnosis because hypnosis comes from hypnos, the Greek god of sleep. Yes. And he knew it has nothing to do with sleep, even though some amateur hypnotists are like, you're going to go to sleep, you're going to go deeply, deeply to sleep. No, that's not what's happening at all because you're alert and awake during hypnosis. I have written several papers on traditional shamans and how they use hypnotic-like procedures. Mm -hmm. And they do. And I think that what they do is to use rituals, ceremonies, spells to get a person to respond to their suggestions to get well mm -hmm. and to stimulate the placebo effect, to stimulate the body's immune system. and. I think that many of the remedies that ancient shamans and not so ancient shamans gave worked because of the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. So to stretch the point just a little bit, I think that this played an important role in human evolution. Think back a hundred thousand years ago when shaman-like practitioners were at work, and if they gave somebody an herb and said, this is going to keep you alive. And if they didn't respond, that person would die off and their genes would drop out of the gene pool. Yeah. But if the person survived, that means that they were amenable to suggestion mm -hmm. and their genes would be part of the gene pool. Mm -hmm. And that's why today people have the capacity for being hypnosed, hypnotized or using self-hypnosis. It all goes back to human evolution and the survival of the genes of people who have responded to suggestion. Mm -hmm. Well. I would be remiss if we didn't touch upon the literature suggesting that hypnosis uh, is psi conducive, that uh, people uh, actually perform better in uh, parapsychology laboratory tests of ESP after they've been hypnotized. I actually did an experiment hypnosis at Maimonides Medical Center in part of the work in the Dream Laboratory where I had people in a hypnotic condition or in a control condition, which simply use their imagination, mm -hmm. try to identify a picture which was in a sealed envelope. Got significant results, by the way. And this is without uh, dreaming? Without dreaming. Mm -hmm. What you might call a hypnotic dream, I said that they would have a dream-like experience. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. In both conditions, both the fantasy imagination condition and in the condition which was absolutely described as hypnosis, where mm -hmm. I said, I am going to hypnotize you and this is going to help you identify the contents of the sealed envelope. Uh -huh. uh, Charles Anderton, my associate and I, did a review of all of the literature on hypnosis and psi. Yes. And that was published and uh, I think it was a major contribution to mm -hmm. the field. It's been done again by other people because now the work is much more extensive. But certainly, I think hypnosis is a psi-conducive condition, at least for many, many people. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've talked about uh, the objective of hypnosis. We've talked about the, the importance of self-hypnosis and the locus of control. There's also, while the person under hypnosis doesn't fall asleep, it would seem as if they are in some kind of an altered state of consciousness. 
varying depending on whether they're in deep hypnosis or there's sort of a spectrum or a scale. There's a spectrum, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. There is. There is a spectrum. The interesting thing is that most people, even though they're the tip of the spectrum and sometimes don't even feel themselves being hypnotized, still respond to the suggestion. They can still help to the by hypnosis because the suggestion mm -hmm. triggers the immune response or gets them oriented to whatever task they want to perform. Mm -hmm. I actually, I think, was the first, maybe the only person to do a joint Cuban-American hypnosis symposium in Cuba. Oh my! Yes, this was back in the days when you could only get into Cuba as part of a scientific delegation. Hmm. And I went to a health psychology conference, I gave a talk on hypnosis, and there was one hypnotic practitioner in Cuba, and we did a private symposium for, uh, there was only one hypnotic practitioner at the conference, I yeah. should say, and we did a group a hypnotic seminar for a group of his fellow hypnotists, most of them physicians and psychologists, mm -hmm. in Habana, Cuba. And I think that was the first. And I also did probably the only Soviet-American seminar on hypnosis. That was done with a colleague of mine, Vladimir Rykov, from Moscow during the days of the Cold War mm -hmm. in Milan, Italy. And his type of hypnosis was much more directive than mine. I'm a more non-directive hypnotist who, again, tries mm -hmm. to stimulate the self-hypnotic facilities of the participant, yes. and he says, you are going to be hypnotized, you are going to do this. Well, that's in, a, in accord with the authoritarian regime in Moscow at the time, mm -hmm. so it was very culture-specific. Anyway, we did a three-day seminar that turned out very well for the Italians who were mm -hmm. attended. Well, if we started to talk about international developments in hypnosis, uh, especially some of the interesting things that were going on in the old Soviet Union, uh, we could do a whole other program, and perhaps that's exactly what we should do, but we're out of time for now, Stan. Thank you so much for being with me. You're welcome. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.